welcome everyone to our uh, Pi Day board meeting. Uh, if you would uh, please, <clears throat> please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, welcome everyone uh, to our March meeting, and it is Pi Day. Um, we're ready for our superintendent comments. Thank you, Dr. Towers. Thank you, you're waiting that. Thank you. We had Pi today at <laughs> district office. Some of our Staff members brought in some really good pies. They do it. We ate pie today, didn't we? It was delicious. It was. <laughs> Welcome to tonight's Board of Education meeting. We are so glad you have joined us. I have a few things. First of all, sorry I wasn't with you last month. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for holding down the fort. I was in Portland with our Lincoln uh, Elementary group as they were distinguished schools. So that was awesome at a federal conference. I want to start off by thanking all of our staff for helping with arrival and dismissal today with the storms. And speaking of the storms, we probably will have one rolling through here. Um, at this point, we're in a pretty good uh, building and barrier. and We're kind of on the lower part of the, the land, so we're going to kind of go through our uh, meeting tonight. But uh, thank you for being here. Make sure you're safe going home. Um, but I want to also thank our parents and guardians for continued understanding, flexibility, and support. You always will shelter in place and fully communicate as, uh, communicate as situations arise with the inclement <laughs> weather. And, uh, you know, snow days aren't fun for a superintendent. But when it comes to um, stormy weather, tornadoes, those type of things, and they're in the middle of arrival or dismissal, that's not a fun time. But thank you to our staff. Our administrators did a great job with all that today. So thank you to everyone. Tonight, we are celebrating our school board appreciation month. Special thank you to our board members. You all are the best, and we so appreciate your leadership and guidance that you provide our district communicate our, our, to, in our community. To celebrate, we have some small tokens of our appreciation and then some signs and cards. Hope we give a chance to read those because those are our uh, precious notes from our awesome students, um, and they are made from by, by our very own SESC students. And we just want to say... Thank you for all that you do. Can we give our Board of Education a hand? I also want to take a moment to make certain all stake stakeholders know that the CO team and the Board of Education take every pub public comment seriously. The CO team looks into each situation that is presented. However, please note there are many perceptions that stakeholders speak on, and not everything that is presented is the full picture or factual. With that said, we cannot rebuttal and or confirm during public comments, but please rest assured that we do follow up and make certain our main focus is on what's best for our students and the needs of our students and staff. And so I just want to make sure I make that comment tonight. We thank you for your continued willingness to share your perception, concerns, and also your support for our kids here in the SESD. We have a very special place, and uh, we want to continue to move forward together. It's the middle of March. That means spring break is just around the corner. I think we're all ready for that. We have another week to go. We'll get there. It's hard to believe that we're down to our last two and a half months of school. Uh, it's getting pretty excited in the spring months as we progress towards the end of gra to graduation. The spring activity sports season is in full swing. We have a string of great theatrical fine arts performances lately. Our SES Chamber Choir received the highest ranking or rating that an ensemble can have at the uh, Misha State Festival. It's called an exemplary rating. We just had one again today with SEHS with their uh, wind ensemble. Also, both our SEHS and SC West orchestras earned an exemplary rating at the 2024 Misha Large Group Festival. SEH just finished up an outstanding week weekend of performances at their spring musical. I think we had one board member that was <laughs> specifically involved with that. It went wonderful. Well, you can give a hand for that. Yeah, you can have it. That was, that musical was Guys and Dolls, and congratulations to all of our student performers. Our spring sports teams are starting to, to uh, game competition. We've had a lot of jamborees the last couple of days, and uh, 
we are just ready for a wonderful spring of activities and games. And we just love to see our students shine uh, in those uh, events. Reminder, due to a solar eclipse scheduled for the afternoon of Monday, April 8th, we have moved our original scheduled K through 8 grade early release day from Friday to April, or Friday, April 12th to April, Monday, April 8th. Additionally, our originally scheduled high school early out on Wednesday, April 10th will also move to Monday, April 8th. This decision is primarily for the safety of our middle school and high school students as the timing of the eclipse coincides with our regular afternoon dismissal period. Board of Education seats are once again up for re-election. We have three candidates for two open board seats for the election this April. We are excited that we have three highly qualified candidates running for election to our Board of Education. However, I want to remind and encourage all stakeholders to act with appropriateness and kindness as the election process plays out. In the SCSD, we are a diverse population that seeks unity and positivity towards meeting the needs of all students. Let's make certain all of our focus and actions are centered on the good for all kids and not attacking one another. We are SCSD United. Our Board of Education is a nonpartisan volunteer group of public servants. This tonight we have Worked hard to prepare for this meeting, and tonight we will have important discussion presentations on the following. Policy changes for second reading. Policy changes for first reading. A meet and confer agreement for certified, classified, and transportation. Our, our wonderful uh, leadership and our three union groups are with us tonight, so we appreciate that. Federal programs program review, that's going to be the highlight of the evening. <laughs> right, Nija? Except for the special ed education program <laughs> review from our very own Julie McClard. And then also, we all can't wait for the financial report at the end. Yes. Highlight of the evening. We're in the midst of a very, very productive 23-24 <laughs> school year. I want to encourage us all to continue to be, because that is our theme this year, safe, respectful, and responsible as we continue to work together in our school year. Long journey together. And now I'm finished. <laughs> Good <job>. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, with all of your comments. We appreciate them, mm -hmm. and, and we appreciate your um, thanks to all of us. Uh, item 3.04 is our board communication, and we do have We some. did uh, receive a letter from the museum saying thank you for helping us for the entire board. Oh. <laughs> and then also just wanted to again say thank you to all the students um, and classrooms who took time to appreciate us and show their gratitude. So. And, uh, we had a, a work session before this one, so some, we've looked at many of them. I, uh, I don't know, the old grandma in me or the old teacher in me or something. Those are they're, they're cute cards. So I appreciate that they did that. <clears throat> um, item 3.05 is board recognition week. Is that? I kind of already did it. Didn't yeah, you did. did. I don't, it, it simply is uh, listing the board members uh, um, and a resolution but we we <laughs> it's it's one of those whereas 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 and we, we appreciate that we're appreciated <laughs> and and I'm always I'm never lost for words but as a superintendent you can only ask uh, to to work alongside or underneath uh, seven wonderful people like we have here we've got a really good balanced approach and I just appreciate their leadership or to your leadership, I should talk to you all. But uh, thank you for, again for all that you do. It's greatly appreciated in your service. Thank you. Item 3.06 is audience comments. All regular and special meetings of the board shall be open to the public. Since the board desires to be a good listener and be responsive to the community, persons desiring to address the board may do so during the time so allotted on the agenda and according to established procedures. During the audience, of each board meeting, patrons are invited by the president to speak for or against any proposal on the candidate agenda or on any other school concern. The individual is asked to identify him or herself, limit comments to three minutes, and avoid discussion of personality. The president reserves the right to limit the number of presentations and or length of comments. At the discretion of the president, patrons may be recognized at other times during the board meeting. The board is very interested in audience comments. According to board policy, members cannot respond during the actual meeting. The board will listen to audience comments. If necessary, additional follow-up will occur through the 15 minutes. Thank you. 
Uh, we do have some audience uh, comments. Uh, Teresa Lipsitch. Hello, my name is Teresa Linsnick, mom of a St. Charles High grad, taxpayer in St. Charles and um, substitute playground monitor in the district. Uh, I first want to thank the school board for working to help our students. Um, and also, we as a district need to be concerned about other districts around us and the students there because eventually they affect our district too. I'm sure you've heard about the shocking news of the student on student violence at um, of a, a Hazelwood East student that put another student in the hospital in critical condition. Please, let's have a moment of silence for all involved. Uh, now what I came here for, are we as a school district sexually harassing our students? I know that sounds strong, but I have a friend who wanted, won a sexual harassment case on her job because HR would not respond to her complaint that included fellow employees playing music at work with sexually explicit words. She got a large settlement. Did you know that there are books in our, in our school libraries that are sexually explicit? There is a Missouri law, it's statute 573.550, that makes it an offense of the law to provide sexually explicit material to a student. The definition of this statute is, quote, a person commits the offense of providing explicitly explicit, providing explicit sexual material to a student if such person is affiliated with a public or private elementary or secondary school in an official capacity and knowing of its content and character and that such person provides, assigns, supplies, distributes, loans, or coerces acceptance of or the approval of the providing of explicit sexual material to a student or possesses with the purpose of providing, assigning, supplying, distributing, loaning, or coercing acceptance of or the approval of the providing or the approval of the providing of explicit sexual material to a student. It also says, quote, person affiliated with a public or private elementary or secondary school in an official capacity is an administrator, teacher, librarian, media center personnel, substitute teacher, teacher's assistant, student teacher, law enforcement officer, school board member, school bus driver, guidance counselor, and, and the list goes on. Are we sexually harassing our students if, if there's sexually explicit material in our libraries? Um, I can imagine that most parents in our district, and probably most of us, don't know, don't know, ex I'm almost finished. What, this, that's it? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you, thank Teresa. you. Shelly Gowan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shelly Gowan, and I currently have three awesome grandchildren in the St. Charles School District. Two of them have graduated and in college. Last month, I presented the board my concerns on books that are currently on our shelves. I have more information. Um, I got this information obtained on stcharlesparentassociation.com where I found many books so concerning that I must continue to address this issue. I found out that many books in our school library are in violation of Missouri law. I have copied some pages of just one of the books for your review, as well as I highlighted content that clearly has obscene rape, profanity, racism, drug abuse, and gender confusion. Last meeting, I was stopped when I began to quote contents out of the book that was inappropriate. I need to ask you, why was I stopped when the same words are currently occupying our shelves, ready for our students to check them out? It is important to keep adult material out of the hands of children as well as young adults. 
Some of these books actually state on the cover the contents that are so full of obscenities that you must be 18 years of age to read. Just because it's a book does not mean it to be on our shelves, on our library shelves in the St. Charles School District. What is the process of how books get approved? I'm not blaming anybody because I know things could get missed. People make mistakes. Things get misunderstood and pencil, pencil pushed. But now I'm bringing it up to your attention. And I need your help, guys. Let's change it. This process is going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of cleanup. I sent everyone, and I, I realize I, I sent everyone an email just before I got here um, regarding the info on just nine books. But honestly, I found over 100, and that was just in the high school library. I know there is a removal process, but it goes deeper than that. Because of the content, my next question is, when do we begin taking these books out of circulation? And how quickly can we have a new process to set forth a, to clean up our libraries? Let's work together. I'm not here to walk in strife. I'm here for the kids, for the children, for the young adults, for my grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren, in getting our libraries in line with the Missouri state law and focusing on educating our students. Um, I only have six copies, but I'm going to pass it out. Please feel free to copy it. Um, on one of the books, I highlighted some really gross stuff. It's a graft, and if you could please take notice, and this is just one of the books. And then I also sent six of you email, and I apologize. I thought there was seven board, but I'm, since I'm new. So here I'm you sorry. are, yeah. and that's it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't hear the... <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, we can share it. Thank you so much. Gayla Gilmore. Good evening. Um, I'm here representing our just over 100 MSTA members certified and non-certified staff here in our district. Uh, in contents with School Board Appreciation Week, we just wanna give you at least four words of thanks. We've already heard from our members that we're really grateful for how you guys handled the weather and the dismissal today, so they just wanted to thank you for that. Um, our members also wanted to say that they really appreciate your continuous support and your consideration during our salary negotiations for both our teachers and our non-certified staff. So we just really appreciate you guys thinking about your employees first and really giving us a chance to be heard. And we also wanna thank, you've been mentioned, but we really wanna thank Lori Gibson for her support with the Guys and Dolls musical at SCHS. I personally, I, I work uh, at SCHS and I had a lot of students just say that they really felt appreciated and valued knowing that at least one of our board members was there and on their side. Uh, this extracurricular activity is especially important for students beyond their graduation. It builds skills that they, I mean, they're very appreciative of. Their public speaking, their coordination, their public relations. They're really grateful for the fact of knowing that you guys are there for them and show them that you really care. And then lastly, we just are very grateful to you for your support for our elementary school uh, teachers, uh, especially at Jefferson and Hardin. Um, and the other elementary schools as they move into state testing time, um, and for our high school teachers as well as we move into EOC time. Myself, I'm, you know, it's crunch time now. <laughs> um, so we just really thank you guys for showing teachers that you care, um, especially through the visits that you guys do firsthand through our staff. I've had a lot of our members say that you guys have come on through and they just appreciate seeing your faces and seeing the students who are impacted by your decisions. So thank you so much for listening and. Thank you so much for everything you do for our staff and employees. Dean Meyer. Hello, my name is Dean Meyer. I am president of the SCTEA. We represent bus drivers, monitors, uh, mechanic, um, dispatchers, and fuel attendants for the uh, transportation department. 
I uh, wanted to thank the uh, school administration and the school board for uh, taking our concerns under consideration and presenting uh, a package, collective bargaining package that I think is beneficial for both the transportation department and the school district. Uh, it will help us uh, farther down the road in retention and uh, uh, recruitment of new drivers. Uh, it's a big step and uh, going from not the best paid uh, to up near the top now, uh, it's really gonna open up the opportunities for us to get good recruitment into the, the school district. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Thank you. Brandon Kearns. Good evening, SCEA board community. My name is Brendan Kearns. I'm the president of the St. Charles Education Association, the exclusive bargaining organization for all um, certified employees and nurses for the district. Um, like everybody else, I want to give a shout out to you all during Board Appreciation Month. Thank you for your volunteer time and your efforts for advocacy uh, within our community and hearing out our concerns. Um, also want to give a special shout out to our elementary employees, our late staying ones at Monroe and Blackhurst and um, Harris. Uh, I cannot imagine wrangling elementary kids in a tornado is a daunting task. So um, hats off to you guys on handling that. I was sheltering securely in place at Success Campus. So um, final thing I just want to mention, uh, we finished up our bargaining in February. It was a great um, couple days of sessions, great discussions back and forth. Um, since the Missouri State Supreme Court has affirmed our rights to collectively bargain in the state since 09, we've had that relationship, or 08, sorry. We've had that relationship and it has been a terrific one. It's benefited both teacher working conditions and student learning conditions. Um, school districts are best when we have an organization speaking for staff as well as for administration. We think we've put together a great deal to keep this a competitive district, to keep teachers happy and to keep students learning well. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Jill Meyer. <laughs> Did, you turn off? Did you turn off your mic? I think it's off. <laughs> I'm Jill Meyer. I'm the co-president of the St. Charles Education Support, Support Staff um, Association. Um, my fellow co-president, um, Kathy Alsdorf, is out sick today, so um, passing on her greetings also. But wanted to first say thank you to uh, administration and board member Heidi for um, all the work that we did during our negotiations. Um, we spent a lot of time um, pre-negotiations, um, our days of negotiation. Um, again, echo what uh, Brendan and Dean said about coming together with um, an agreement that will help us retain and recruit classified employees to this district. Um, so we appreciate the board for all the work that um, you do and all your volunteer time and um, greatly appreciate you doing this Board of Appreciation Month. So thank you all for everything. Thank you. At this point in our meeting, we take a very brief, very brief uh, break uh, with the weather that it is. Many of you may want to, I don't know if we can beat the weather, but this is your chance to go ahead and take care of things at home. But you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. We will take a five minute break.
sorry. Thank you. Item 3.07, do I have a motion to amend or adopt uh, the agenda? And do we have a second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So our agenda is adopted. Uh, 4.01 is our consent agenda. For efficiency, the school board utilizes a consent agenda. Items placed on the consent agenda are routine in nature, are, are among the many decisions that the board has already determined are in the domain of the administration. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Approve the consent agenda. I second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That consent agenda is approved. Item 6.01, this is our policy with the second reading. It only had that one little minor change in wording. Is there any other discussion on that? Do I have a motion to approve uh, policy KH? I move to approve policy KH as presented. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? That is approved. 7.01, these are policy readings under our first um, first reading, uh, and quite a few of them. Were there any discussions on any one item in particular, or having read through them, I, they were, uh, I don't know why they couldn't have said that on one policy. <laughs> it wasn't anything substantive, right? It was mainly just kind of minor corrections and language changes. There yeah, wasn't like a change in policy per se, is more of just like a modernization. I, a yeah. I feel because we already have a drug-free, smoke-free campus and a lot of this just was to make clearer, I think, those policies. So, um, The one thing that both of those policies as it relates to um, drug-free workplace and employee alcohol is specifically adding language for marijuana, uh, which if you look at the, obviously the things in the mm -hmm. green are new Right, and so that wasn't there prior. So that does add more clarity for us as we are working through situations that may pertain that. And especially since now, uh, correct. In the state of Missouri, mm -hmm. people can have can yes. legally at, at age. I believe five. that was the modernization that. Yes. <laughs> that Mr. Was, I was, was trying to say it in a very soft yes. way. I like the yes. word modernization. <laughs> All right, so that will come up again uh, next month for our uh, second reading. Item 7.02, this is the uh, professional agreement for our certified staff. Do I have a, was there any discussion that we, uh, do I have a motion to approve the certified meet and confer agreement? I make a motion to approve the certified staff agreement. I'll second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That agreement uh, passes. 7.03 is the certified agreement for our classified staff. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, classified collective bargaining agreement? I move to approve All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That agreement passes. 7.04 is the meet and confer agreement for transportation. Do I have a motion to approve uh, that agreement? I move to approve the transportation meet and confer agreement as presented. I second it. Right. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. Item 7.05, this is a uh, uh, Hardin School, our, uh, the repiping bid proposal. Jeremy? Yeah, so this isn't something that you know, brings a lot of excitement, <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, just based on the uh, age of the system that we currently have at Hardin. However, um, last year, 
we were met with some frustrated staff members, and I'm sure frustrated students, um, about the system and, and the, its ability to operate uh, well, meaning there's a lot of temperature adjustments between hot and cold um, that were impacting uh, the teachers and the students. And what we've come to find, uh, which was known prior to me taking on this role, but I certainly got educated on once I took the role, uh, was the uh, recommended technology that was used, recommended um, uh, equipment that was necessary to install this system about 10 years ago through uh, two bond issues ago uh, was failing. Uh, specifically, the aluminum piping leading to each unit and uh, the connections, which that company is no longer in, in uh, around. Uh, it was called uh, a Revlock connectors. Um, and there's no way with the aluminum piping that's used to establish a connection that's going to hold the refrigerant in place uh, to the degree that we want it to be held to in order for the systems to operate efficiently uh, every single day. So the systems that we're talking about is, is a fairly, well, it's new to, to me, but they're basically like a multi-split unit that you would see hanging on a wall. These are inside our classrooms and the ceiling, and they adjust throughout the day to monitor and maintain that system with the, with the purpose of being more energy efficient. So it's a mix of hot cold throughout that day just to make sure that room maintains. Um, and uh, it's, it's good technology, the actual system is, however, the infrastructure leading to it uh, was not good. And uh, we're, we want to go back in and replace that based on recommendations through outside entities um, with copper piping, tried and true copper piping with copper connections leading to each one of these units. Um, so that's, that's what this bid is about, uh, is, is establishing that fix. Um, and um, again, it's not, it's not an exciting way to spend money on something that is 10 years old, um, but it's something that we think uh, will provide value with it being done correctly. The other component that's inside of this is going ahead and replacing the condensers inside the unit since we would be address, we'd be touching those as well. When we, when we do that, it's going to add to the life of that unit, uh, each one of those units inside the school, uh, but it also puts us on a cloud base. Um, um, how the best way to say it? It puts it on a cloud where it's managed online. So if we know that there's any way that the system is not operating efficiently, uh, Daikin, who supplies these materials, gets an alert, and that informs our HVAC technicians to go out and look at it. If it's after hours, they send out support, and that's included in this bid as well. Right now, we have two HVAC technicians for our entire district. They, they work, they're, they're fantastic workers, but this certainly puts a strain on them to have to monitor the system um, well throughout. So the bid is expensive. It's uh, 1.3, I believe, or close to 1.3 uh, million. We do have, it. Dr. Draper and I have worked it out uh, with our ESSER three money. Thankfully, we still have that, um, or else we would be pulling from operating to afford this expense to get uh, conservatively a million of it paid through through that. I didn't want to uh, over-promise and under-deliver for you all, so we conservatively have it set at a million dollars because we know for sure that we can take that much from our ESSER three that has to be spent by September of 24. Um, so that's where we're at with this, this proposal. I'm just glad we have the break between this and the financial report later, because usually they're <laughs> back to back and you put everybody tired. Um, for the 1.3, like I think we don't really have much of a choice for trying to have another bid or seeing if it would be cheaper with somebody else since it's proprietary. But have we done, like, how do we feel about it? Like, have we done some analysis on it or are we just kind of accepting it as what fate has aligned? Yeah, it's a good question because it's, uh, this is not something that I wanted. <laughs> I wasn't eager about doing. So yeah, we uh, certainly reached out and, and, the, and a lot of the language that we received back was, well, we have to buy it from this company anyhow and in order for the warranty to exist, they will be on site, they will be monitoring the work, they will be overseeing the work, so there would be an increased cost from those uh, uh, companies as well. So uh, we know with them uh, supplying the product, uh, or I believe with them supplying the product, I feel confident about it, and then overseeing it, the warranty for um, the warranty will be achievable and uh, certainly they're, they've been around, they've been in this industry, I believe, in, in Missouri, uh, for nearly 50 years, if I can remember correctly. I know it was something close to that. Anybody else in the study? 
we would start, so Harden, if we, we have March 19th uh, proposal coming in for all the uh, bond work there. So it would be, if that gets approved, um, we're, we're fine with the finances and we bring it to the board, obviously. If that gets approved, it would start in uh, last day of school in order to get this done. But we're also looking at, just to remind, a phased in flooring replacement for Harden, a demo and a addition, in addition to with our food service money, not our operating money or our bond money, uh, a kitchen uh, renovation as well. Would so, this be affected by any of that or would it, would there cause any problems by trying to do any of those other ones at this we've, at the same time? We've, we've spoke to our architects and our, um, our, our engineers and told them that if this is approved that they need to plan it and they said it wouldn't be a problem, it will just be very messy over okay. the summer. <laughs> Um, just for curiosity, knowing that we're kind of stuck with one company, what would it take to, or what would it cost if we wanted to scrap the system and try to go out and replace it? I'll, you can just say a significant amount more, and that'd be fine. My, my, yeah, significant amount good. more. I, if I were to be held right now, yeah. I, would, I would think at least 2.5 is, is, is a guess for me. So you said that's going to increase the life of it. How, how much longer are they going to add? We're 10 years in. Yeah, so they, they what we have, I believe, is five-year parts, or five-year labor, 10-year parts. i got to remember if I'm saying that right. 10-year parts, five-year labor warranty. Okay. So they're guaranteeing the work that they do um, for that period of time. Okay. We're just doubling its life then, basically. I, I believe that's... And it, for but a new one, it lasts probably 10 years, too? We're, we would hope we get 15 to 20 is what we would hope. Had we had better connections leading to these, um, you know, I think that we, that would have been achievable, but we know that there's been some uh, strain on those condensers um, due to the leakage that has occurred over this past 10 years. And, and the leaking isn't easy to find um, because it's typically slow. And then you notice, all of a sudden, you notice a spot in the ceiling. Right. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, no, now we have an issue. Or uh, you hear a complaint, like it's... For some reason, our unit is hot and cold, hot and cold, and then we go in and it's sometimes too late. We're making major uh, replacement repairs to, to salvage that unit. Okay. Is there any analysis of like if other schools or, or places have done this? Is my guess, like the cost savings? Uh, for the VRV systems? Yeah. Um, we know that it's being used uh, readily throughout large, uh, large building spaces, but I've not asked any other industry to give me an analysis on that. Essentially, one point three million dollars today, or two point five today, and then ten years from now, we're gonna be back to like the two and a half to replace it. So, long yeah. term, we're not really. Yeah. Would we save money if we replaced all of it now for a longer life, as opposed to in the future from a cost of money perspective? Right. I guess is kind of my question. Yeah, and uh, you know, that's a tricky scenario just based on market factors. Right. We know where we're at now, but what will we become? And one of the things that. I was getting educated on is the federal regulation surrounding refrigerant, which I've been told could change by the day. Right now, um, if we do this, we fall within the regulations right now. They do anticipate in 2025 the regulations changing, which could add, this is ballpark, another 500000 onto that cost uh, to meet those federal guidelines. But again, I don't want to say that as a reason why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, but we know that that legislation is currently out there. Again, it could change, but it is out there to begin in 2025. And again, we're using ESSER funds for a million dollars worth of this that has to be spent before September. And the company that we're going with is the one that is guaranteed under this correct. program, correct. correct? This company, um, I asked this question. There's a lot of questions I asked, I'm sorry. <laughs> so since we're speaking about that, um, this company does a lot of uh, tips, governmental uh, procuring uh, for contracts. Uh, we know that they're doing some now in uh, neighboring school districts to the tune of a $30 million project. Uh, that's all being spent. When I, their their ESSER money is far greater than ours, that school districts. Uh, but they're looking at doing uh, this same work just in many buildings uh, for that particular district. So. Um, I did ask uh, an, another engineer from FSG if he recommends this. Uh, he gave his recommendation. I didn't have him put it in writing. I just wanted to call and verify. Uh, so I feel like 
you know, it's the best course of action based on the information that we have. Uh, but again, it's not something that I was, hey, let's, let's do this. This sounds like a great time. But it also sounds like, I mean, I like that it's uh, to be proactive on not this, this issue, but I know there have been things in this district that we were ahead of the curve on getting things done, like the lighting, mm -hmm. which has been a big, big savings. Mm -hmm. Uh, our safe defend program districts are just now starting to do some of that. I mean, I Correct. think I'm glad that uh, you're asking lots of questions. <laughs> so most of it's going to be as for money anyway. So. Any other discussion? Do I have a motion to approve the bid proposal for Hardin Middle School? Uh, move to approve the VRV repipe bid proposal. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed? All right, that passes. Item 8.01, here comes our federal program review. And the crowd goes crazy. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ethan. Good evening, everyone. Let me just um, start by introducing our Coordinator for federal programs, Nidra Woolfolk. She will be um, just giving you an update and a review of our federal programs and our spending. So I'm going to turn this over to Nidra. And then, Nidra, if you push the little guy, that'll turn your mic on. There you Hello. go. Hello. Hello. As Dr. Draper said, I'm the federal programs coordinator, and I'm just here to give you an overview of our federal program spending. Um, so I hope you enjoy. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Chris, there's a presentation up there at the top. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the city of St. Charles School District. Uh, we currently use three title grants to service our students. Um, they are titles one, two, and three. And I'll just give you a quick overview of how we use those funds um, from each title. Title one, part A. Oh, sorry, help. Here we go. We have, yes, title one, uh, part A, title one, part D, title two, part A, and also we have title three. So our Title I, Part A, it ensures our students receive fair and equitable high quality education. The district is able to, to provide high quality education through Title I supports, including supplemental math and language arts services to students. In 2022-23, um, Blackhurst, Coverdale, Lincoln, Monroe, and Null Elementaries were eligible to receive Title I funds. These schools' economic deprivation was greater than or equal to the district's average of 27%. Eligibility is determined through the free and reduced lunch count and edu educational need in each building. Our Early Childhood Education Center also receives Title I A funding that pays preschool teachers and paraprofessionals salaries and benefits. Here's just a quick summary of what our Title I funds go toward. We have about a million dollars for the grant, and most of those funds are used to pay teachers, interventionist salaries and benefits, um, pre-K teachers, and para paraprofessionals as well. We also get an amount of money for parent involvement activities in each building. Um, most buildings have like math night, reading night, um, so parents can come and get involved, help keep their kids on track. We also um, have an allocation for five non-public schools that are neighboring non-public schools. And so we're here for a summary of our Title I, and Dr. Draper will give you a little information about Title I. So Title I D, this is um, the, the money that we historically use to fund. It's for um, students who are at risk uh, and what they call it delinquent, and so this is our JJC program. And so the funds that we receive from Title I D goes directly to JJC. As a district, we, last year, we, 
we hired a full-time teacher at JJC, and then the $12,000 that we got in Title I D funds, we used to pay a teacher part-time to help over. So we had one and a half teachers over at the JJC. This year, because the needs were so great there, um, they were maxing out on the number of beds, and it was just really impossible um, for that, our full-time teacher to reach all students. So the district took on the cost of, taking, of hiring a, a second teacher at the JJC. So we now employ two teachers at JJC, and then the money that we receive for Title I D funds, we are using for summer school programming at JJC this summer. And would we like to add what we did today? I, oh, oh sorry, yes. is that coming up? No, 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 it's, it's not. So you, go ahead and add. That's great. That's great news to share with everyone. So first of all, we have two fantastic teachers down there. And um, as of today, was it our fourth or fifth? Four. Three, four. three we're, four, we're four today. Right? Total we had four. number three and number four, two uh, young men, um, basically get their, yep. their, their diploma. Today. Their diploma today. So, and, and and so we've, we've had four now this year. This year. Four. And up until this point, we had not had and one years, single so graduate I've from been the here JJC. Eight years, we have not had any, and now we have four. Four this year, year, and two more slated by the end of the year. They are catching so. fire on instruction. Yep. It <laughs> is <laughs> unbelievable. Yep. So, so the students at the uh, that we're serving uh, are not just our district stu students. No, uh, they could be. They could uh, be. They St. could be Louis from City. anywhere. They could mm -hmm. be St. Louis City. Mm -hmm. So if it, it just depends on, you know, so in order to get there, you have to do something bad, yeah. right? So um, if so, if the crime is committed here in St. Charles County, okay. then those students from wherever they are, from St. Louis City, St. Louis County, from Warren County, from Illinois, those students come to the JJC and they become a part of the City of St. Charles School District at that point. Uh, and we're required, we're responsible for their education at that point. We have a great partnership with the JJC uh, staff and our, and our teachers, and it's just been amazing to see these young people uh, basically earn their diploma mm -hmm. while they're with us. Mm -hmm. And again, we, we're up to. And some of four. them will tell you, you know, a, a year ago, uh, I wasn't thinking about school. You know, a year ago, I was out running the streets, and school wasn't anything that was on, in my forefront. And, and then I'm here. Uh, I'm required to go to school, and they're so thankful to the teachers and to the staff at the JJC. And I will, we will commend JJC. They've really turned it around this year as well with uh, just some of the things that we're seeing. Um, our teachers speak highly of the staff there and some of the changes that they've made in their programming, which I think is also helping us to see the results that we're seeing. It's, it's heavy. I mean, it's, we're not, it's, it's, there's a lot of needs there, and, yep. and they've yep. turned that, they've just turned it around. It's pretty neat, so... So, we love being a part of it. You guys go down there. We were there today. We do. Yeah, we yeah. typically go once a month and meet with the staff. So, and then the neat thing is they allow us to come in when uh, the young people are, were to the point where we're, they're going to receive their diploma. We're able to give them a certificate. Their actual diploma will come in May, mm -hmm. but we give them a certificate. We get to bring a cookie cake in. We get to have, <laughs> and then what the cool thing too is what and shout out to Brett Coburn, our director of Success Campus, because he's over that and does a great job. One neat thing we do is each um, graduate gets to pick out a book that they want that is just theirs, and you think, oh, that, but it's pretty special. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, it's neat. They're picking a book out, and they're, they're like, yeah, I already read my book, and it's just, yep. it's pretty neat. It Sorry, Andrew, yeah, we just got excited. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> totally fine. So yeah, so uh, so Title One Part D is the money that's allocated for JJC, and it's about twelve thousand dollars a year. At that money actually decreased. It used to be about fourteen thousand. Um, they took about two thousand of that away. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to our Title Two, <clears throat> Part A. And with Title Two, our district, we make sure that our principals and teachers and other school leaders have like great PD to make sure that they can go back and help our increase student achievement in their buildings. So we work closely with the District Professional Development Committee, and they come together and they do evaluations of this PD. Um, and this is how we come up with year-round professional development and also our full-day um, development for certified staff. So um, if you look Part A, we do have to give a portion of our Part A, Title II Part A, to also to our non-public schools for professional development, 
We also are able to buy instructional materials and supplies for those school districts. Um, and we get about 121,000 in benefits for our class size reduction teacher. In the past year, we ha we've had one, um, but we also use about 52,000 um, for development and instructional materials as a district. And Title III, our Title III is for, it's our ELL grant, and we also, the district is committed to involving the ELL immigrant and migrant parents in education for their children. And so every year around this time, I think in March, um, we have an ELL night where we can bring families together. Um, the EO staff, um, some of our admin team, and uh, principals throughout the district are there to welcome those families. Um, our EO uh, department has definitely taken off this year. Um, mm -hmm with the different percentages. But just to give you a little um, insight on that, we have about roughly 30,000 that we've spent to provide salary and benefits for our district parent liaison. And she helps those parents um, with enrollment. She can even help with doctor's appointments, um, help with school visits if we have IEP meetings, things of that nature. She's there to help those families um, through that and navigate. I bet, I, I wonder, sometimes I think like, no, you know, they're nervous, so kind of help navigate that journey for them. I'm going to interrupt you again. So yes. we had our ELL night at Kokomo Joe's last week, and it was awesome. <laughs> the families are it's just so fun. I, had, I have to tell you yeah. this little story. So this little guy, he's probably, I say little, he's probably second, third grade. He comes right up to me, gets right in front of me. I'm sitting right there at Kokomo Joe's, got my suit on. He just looks up at me and says, you, 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 the, you big boss? I said, yeah, I am. How do you come, big boss? <laughs> I said, you got to go to school. He's okay. He just walked away. We but, that wasn't question. it awesome? It was awesome. It's we just a, such a great night. Our yeah. teachers do it's such a great job. It's about 200 of our uh, 200 students and their family members there, so it was pretty awesome. So cool. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. Well, that's just our, our overview <laughs> of title, um, and thank you, and I appreciate your time. Any questions? Any questions? Shout out for Nidra. She does yes. a fantastic does. job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, only question I have is, do we know how much like of an impact it'd be to the money we give to non-public schools for legislation that's out there right now? Do we know the impact? Yeah. Um, I do not. I don't know. I, I wouldn't even want to guess. But um, I can tell you that for each um, student that lives in our district that uh, um, attends their school, they get about the same amount we get for each student to go there. So I don't know the impact, so I can't yeah. speak to that. But Beep. yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want me to turn the little guy off? Or is it, yeah, is it most of your funding federal, though? Yes. It, is. it wouldn't be affected as yeah. much by <laughs> state. But I mean, it could be yeah. some, but. <laughs> yeah, those are the title funds are federal funds. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you can turn that off. I can't. Okay. I don't have a Nidra that's going to come up and present for me. <laughs> Thank you, Deidre. Thank you, Deidre. Um, <laughs> do I have a motion to approve the federal programs review as presented? I move to approve the federal programs review as presented. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Item 8.02 is a special education program review. Yeah, Julie? All right. I think I'm getting better at getting this shorter, so I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not on the clock. I tried to, yeah, tried to condense it into the, into the uh, PowerPoint. Chris, can you bring it up? Okay. I will. All right. So, uh, this program review, I had my helpers here, um, Ashley Jones, who will be presenting this in two years as our assistant <laughs> superintendent. Um, and then we have Clar uh, Clarissa Byers sitting behind her. She's our other special ed coordinator right now. Peggy Shelton, our transition coordinator. And Ann Westbrook would have been with us, um, but she is actually at the Magic House with PAT and ECC tonight. So. Actually, I don't want to throw Ann under the bus, but they did cancel that event because of the weather. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it was a last minute. Last minute. She thought the did board meeting was canceled. The <laughs> <laughs> I was Sometimes gonna... the boss just the big boss. And, uh, I had a notification that said Ann that Ann does too, live so. in another state, so maybe she just needed to get home safely today. 
but they were they were really yes. late with our kids today. They did a yeah. great job of yeah. taking care of Willow. It's all right. Willow being in Westbrook. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll text her now. Apologize. <laughs> All right, so if we go on to our program pr description, um, special education covers ages 3 through 21, so the day they turn 3 to through the day they turn 21. Um, for special education, you have to kind of pass a three-prong test, so our students not only need to meet criteria under um, state-identified category or categories, um, but they also have to show an evidence of adverse effect, um, that the disability has to show an evidence of an adverse effect on educational performance, and also students need to um, show that they require specially designed instruction to receive FAPE. So those three things will get a student eligible for special education. Hold on, go back one. Um, and then our goal is to make sure we provide those services and any related services in the least restrictive environment. All right. Okay, so um, from two years ago was the last program review. We had a few goals. Um, that we are working on, and um, I'll kind of go through these quickly because I talk about them in our later slides, but basically we were trying to look at increased student independence and improved instructional outcomes for all students in the least restrictive environment, creating a more systematic way of evaluating and identifying and serving students in our district-wide programs, like those programs that are um, smaller, you know, smaller settings um, that may not be in their home schools, um, implement specific methodology and curriculum in those dis district-wide programs with fidelity um, and through giving training and professional development for those staff, improving the graduation rates of students with IEPs and expanding opportunities for students in the ECSE program to learn with typically developing peers. So those were just some of the things we targeted. Our, um, and if you go, uh, let me see, I don't, I don't have it on a slide, but when we looked at our goals, our other goals, and we'll go through a lot of them, um, basically the state sets goals for us through our special ed profile, um, the Missouri State Performance Plan, um, and um, through our tiered monitoring that we go through every three years. So the things that we kind of picked out that we were focusing on were things that maybe in the past um, were things that we needed to kind of target and improve on. All right, so our early childhood, we're gonna start with ECSE first. So ECSE covers um, kiddos, grades, uh, not grades, ages three through five. Um, so three through the time they're kindergarten eligible. Um, right now, we have nine classroom teachers, 14 paras, five speech paths. I mean, you can kind of see all the staff there, um, examiners, about, um, OTs, PTs. That all of those um, staff members are covered by um, the state grant. Our ECSE program is fully funded by the state grant. So uh, based on the number of students on caseloads, the number of students we evaluate, um, those positions are fully funded. They also give us $75 per student. Um, they give us things that are like outlined in their IEP or reimbursable, things like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of things reimbursed by the ECSE grant, and we've talked about that in many, um, many times before. So we serve kids uh, many different ways. We have students um, that we serve itinerantly, meaning they're, they're either speech path is going out to a daycare and providing services, a parent may be bringing in a student for speech or language services. We serve them in our early childhood classrooms. Our, we have early childhood special ed classrooms, and we even serve students in private separate schools such as uh, Moog um, and, um, you know, which is a, a, a program for students who may be deaf and hard of hearing. So again, that's all funded by the grant. All right, you want to go to the next one? Okay, so some of the things um, since the last program of Allen 2022, um, we've expanded uh, from seven ECSE classrooms to nine, and those ECSE classrooms um, consist of students, um, classrooms that are either in, a, in an integrated model, so they may have like six students with IEPs and a few students without IEPs, um, or they might be fully, uh, they may only have students in, with IEPs in them. And then we have some like specialized classrooms, kind of like we do with the K through 12, that we call learning to learn rooms. So they're really working on kind of those basic skills, basic language skills, um, 
you know, uh, just a little more um, functional type skills in those classrooms. But those classrooms w are not special ed classrooms. Yeah, they're all, this is all, all special, special ed. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, and then again, um, so those are our ECSE classrooms. We also serve kids in our early childhood classroom, yes. Um, and so our students that are served in our early childhood classrooms, um, our early childhood teachers are dual certified in ECSE so that they can serve those students as well and, and serve those minutes. Um, so we also increased from nine to 14 paraprofessionals since our last uh, program review. We've increased in total student enrollment. So on the previous page, that was our uh, December 1st count. We always have December 1st count in special education. But in early childhood, we really look at that June count. So at the end of the year, we, we pretty much take a look at how many kids we touched the whole year, how many in and out we we saw. So we increased in 2022, the, our top number was 96. We currently have 154 students at the end of last school year. Um, and that is, uh, we think that has a lot to do with COVID, mm -hmm. a lot to do with COVID. So, and just to let you know too, every time we open, just for your knowledge, every time we open a classroom, then the state also funds $10,000 towards a grant so that we can like um, furnish the classroom and, and kind of get it up and going too. So, um, and then our percentage of students uh, attending and receiving the majority of services in early childhood program we had a target, um, basically our ECSE program fills out what we call environments and um, with students. And so they look at the number of students who attend only like special education ECSE classrooms, or they might be in an early childhood classroom. Um, but some of our kids might be in a daycare or preschool outside of the time they're here. And then they also attend one of our ECSE classrooms and all this. So when we report these numbers, we look at the full picture of their day. So um, that what they wanted us to have was that students would have a majority of services in the early childhood program, um, meaning the regular ed side of things. And our target was 25% and we met that with 29.2%. Um, and then again, percentage of students attending a separate placement including, so separate placement in ECSE is a little different than K through 12. It's not a separate school. It's um, being in an ECSE, like only, um, you know, special education classroom or a separate school or residential placement. Um, and we wanted that target to be less than 38%. And we did not meet that. We had that, that, that was 49%. And that's, again, um, we were, were kind of, Ann and I have talked about like trying to get a team taught classroom together that's um, more of a um, regular ed classroom that might have a special ed classroom in there that would be more of a regular ed environment and some things like that in order to kind of um, progress getting more kids involved in that general education setting. So, um, but again, in early childhood, we're also at the mercy of if parents are placing students in the early childhood setting versus um, the free uh, ECSE classroom. So it's, it's just a little different than K through 12. Um, all right, Chris, next slide. So early childhood outcome data. So we measure our kids' success in early childhood special education um, in a couple different ways. Um, the way that's reported, uh, first I'll tell you, we, we use conscious discipline as our social emotional curriculum or um, skills we teach. We use the Devro Early Childhood Assessment as our screener to kind of look for weaknesses in those areas of social emotional learning. And then they also use the District Common Assess Assessment to, to kind of measure um, early reading, math, um, motor skills, and social emotional. But then this information on here is what the state collects. And those are, those are recorded on MOS forms. Can't remember what MOS stands for anymore. But um, if a student is in our program for longer than six months, so they have to, they can't like enter now and go to kindergarten, we wouldn't record it. But if they're in our, if they enter like at the beginning of the year, we're with us six months and then they leave after, you know, to go to kindergarten or leave. We have them six months, we fill out a MOS form on them. And so on those MOS forms, the state looks at social emotional skills, acquiring listening knowledge, I'm sorry, acquiring and using knowledge and skills and taking appropriate action to meet needs. And teachers just give them like this kind
kind of general rating. And um, it's, I, if you've been around the board for a little while, you've heard me say this a few years, it's not really scientific or real specific, but the state then looks at whether or not um, how much growth we make. So on that little box to the right, you can't read it probably, but it says of the children who entered the program below age expectations, the percent that substantially increased their rate of growth by the time they exi exited. And we met that with 100% in all areas. And then um, the second one says a percent of students who were functioning within age expect expectations by the time they left. So like really those are the kids that you're kind of looking at probably go on to kindergarten and don't need services anymore. And we have um, met that at 50% and the state's at 25%, 26% and 35%. So that's how we're doing there. So we're doing great things over there. Any questions about ECSE? Or I guess I can wait till the end. Would you rather me wait? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, K through 12. So we'll talk a little bit about K through 12. Um, so each of our school buildings serves kiddos with disabilities. Um, the goal of the program, again, we, we talk about least restrictive environment. Um, and again, that's different for every kiddo. Uh, so we try to get them as close to the general ed population as they're able to, to function and make progress. Um, so, but we do have some district-wide programs, and so this is just a kind of li a list of the district-wide programs we have. So these programs are, um, we have specialized programs, like at Jefferson and Hardin, um, we do have some specialized programs within those buildings as well, but the ones on the list are just ones that if you aren't a student in that building, you might be moved to another class, another building in order to attend. So we have two, emotion, uh, two classrooms at Monroe for um, students who might be diagnosed um, um, with emotional disturbance. And um, we have four classrooms, so two at Harrison, two at Coverdale that are specific for students with autism. Um, one at Jefferson that we opened up, I can't even remember, seems like a <coughs> lifetime ago, um, but instead of going through all the transitions we do in our district, we, we created, I think Jeremy was there at the time, where we created a, a five, six, seven, eight classroom at Jefferson so that those students that have a hard time transitioning don't have to transition to Hardin after two years and then move on. And um, then St. Charles West has a um, classroom with multiple disabilities. Again, so does Jefferson, but like St. Charles West serves students from St. Charles High in that building. And then we also have a, an autism classroom over there as well that just opened this year. This? Okay, we've been talking about it for like Ever. We were waiting for the five, six, seven, eight classroom kids to get a little bit older. So I guess it was this year. And then the Triumph Academy, which is at St. Charles West, which again um, is, is our ED program over there. And so we do have specific um, curriculum methodologies that we use in those classrooms, um, such as the autism classrooms, we use Star and Peak. In the ED classroom, we use the AIM program. Um, and then in our multiple disabilities classrooms, we wrote that big old um, essential skills curriculum a few years ago, right before the state put theirs out. So anyway, um, so if we can go on to the next page. Uh, this is our incidence rates. Um, so if you, there's the state that never really has a goal for us with incidence rates, but our incident rate is quite a bit higher than the state average. Um, and it's actually a little bit higher than, you know, even our neighboring um, districts. So. Um, we said at the bottom there, uh, our total population is 18.17 for students with disabilities in our district. You know, we'd like to think that's probably pretty high, um, but I mean, you never know. It, you know, it's, it is what it is. We, we use the criteria, we do our best, but um, we, some things on the left are things that we have tried to, I didn't realize it was going to not show up so well in that purple in this room, but we um, are really trying to have meetings with our examiners to really talk about criteria and procedures. We're having a lot of um, collaborative meetings with them to discuss, um, you know, when we get referrals, sometimes we feel like maybe our examiners feel like oh, there's a lot of pressure on them to kind of go, maybe go along and, and kind of move forward with things. So um, we're trying to help them by collaborating with them um, from this level, of kind of discuss some of these um, situations to see if they really do kind of meet the criteria to move forward with an evaluation. Um, 
And then our PBIS implementation district-wide, we're hoping we kind of help with some of the social emotional referrals, um, coordinator meetings and building SPED team meetings, counselor meetings, we talk about referrals, new teacher orientation, we talk with um, regular and special education staff about referrals and um, eligibility, and then our new teacher, new special ed teacher training that the coordinators do every year to kind of help them with the process as well. Although it's much higher than the state, we do, we, the state does look at disproportionate representation of racial and ethnic groups, and we didn't show any disproportionality there, so that's good. All right, next page, school age placements. So um, this is, the, the state does give us um, goals on school, on placements. They want us to have like a certain percentage of kids and the least, like this least restrictive placement on the continuum and, the, and then the, le the most amount of kids there and the least amount of kids in the more um, restrictive placements. So these are two goals that we have not met. And um, our goal was to have 57.8% of our kids in the regular ed classroom 80% or more of the time. And we only met that at 44.8. And then on the opposite end of things, they wanted us to have less than 9%, more than 40% of the day. And we did not meet that with 11.3%. Those placement and service discussions and decisions don't come from us though. They come from the IEP teams and the parents and the teachers that are working with the kiddos. So what we try to do is train them on what least restrictive looks like. We try to you know, make sure that they have the supports they need. So where there are targets, it's like, but this still shows that we're, you know, we're, we try to do what's best for our kids. And if it means that they, we're just gonna give them the services they need. So um, there's no repercussions for not meeting these targets. It's just they give you targets to, to kind of um, aim for, so. All right, student achievement. The next page. So uh, these, one thing I did want to mention as we kind of go through these, you'll notice that some of the data that we have, um, the last, it'll be data from 21-22, and that's because the last cycle of our MSIP review was 21-22. So in some of the things, we only have data to that point. And then other things like the map data, um, we get that every year. And so that's why that might say 23. So that's kind of why the why there's older and new data in there. So it's all of this is the last piece we got. Um, so I won't go into how we performed across the county and stuff because Earl did that last month. Kind of talks about it, but um, we do have some things with the state. So this first this slide here was about our targets that were on our um, state performance plan. Um, so the first thing was whether or not we have all of our kids participate in um, the statewide assessments. We met that target. Um, in ELA, the target for proficiency for, they basically on their, when they're looking at our targets, they're looking at fourth, eighth, and high school. So that's why these are all fourth, eighth, and high school. And so um, the fourth grade target was 17.5 um, for proficiency in the top two um, proficient in advance. And we met that at 32.4. Uh, in math, the target for fourth grade was 14.6, and we doubled that with 29.4. In math, the target for proficiency for eighth grade was 7.9, and we met that at 11.5. But the targets for eighth grade and high school ELA were not quite met, and the target for high school math was not met. And I believe on that chart, they were like the little, um, the numbers that were suppressed because they were too small of numbers or something like that within there. It's in the full report. Um, I reported out what, what those scores were. Um, and then on the next page, our MAP scores. So this looks at the top 2%. It says top 2%, and it confused me at first. And when I went back and read, it's those top two tiers, the proficient and advanced. So um, they look at third, third through fifth together um, and sixth through eighth. So we outperform the state in grades three, four, five, six, and eight in ELA. Um, we outperform the state in grades three, four, five, and eight in math. Um, our grades three ELA um, was at 24.1, where the state was only at 15.9, so that was quite a bit of gap. And then our grade four ELA was at 31.9% of those kiddos 
were in proficient and advanced where the state was at 14.7. And then grade four math, 29% um, um, in the top two and the state was at 15.5. So those are some of the highlights there. Um, on the next page, we're looking at high school um, top two and then we're looking at all grades together. So the high school outperformed the state in English language arts and in math and our high school um, math was at 23.5% where the state was only 12.2. So it was almost like double what how the state performed. So our kiddos are doing great um, in those areas. Um, and we'll kind of go on to graduation rates and follow up. This one has improved dramatically, dramatically since 2021 and 2022. Um, so our dropout rate, that was one of our big goals that we talked about at the beginning, um, went from 7.4% in 2021 to 2.7 in 2021-22 to 1.2 um, this past year. And the state was at 1.9. So like, yeah, they're working hard. Yeah. That's old Peggy over there working really hard to get those kids <laughs> graduated and ready for adulthood. Um, and then our fourth grade for our four-year graduation rate for the district is 84.9 and much higher than the state, which is 79.1. Again, I, I have to compliment Peggy on that one as well. Part of our transition programs, like our, uh, um, what was it called before it was Bridge to Success? Project Search. Project Search, when we partnered with them at the, um, the, the hotel and embassy suites, wanted our kiddo, they wouldn't let our kids go over there until they were in their fifth year, which, you know, it's a great program, but they wanted fifth year seniors over there. And so we, um, Peggy worked really, really hard to kind of change that. And um, it's a it's a joint collaboration with um, a lot of different districts in our in our area. And um, Orchard Farm is actually the fiscal agent and they work to all work together to kind of pull away from Project Search and create our own program so that we could serve our kids um, starting junior and senior year and still get them on track and get them graduated. So. That, I'm sure that helped those numbers. All right, and then our graduate, next page, sorry, Chris. Um, our next one, the district has almost doubled the percentage of students enrolled in higher education than the state. Um, so if you kind of look at these, they keep track of um, what our kids do after they graduate. We go back and um, have to look at where they are. Um, and this gets reported out again on that um, MSIP review and I think the last um, one we have on this is our 21-22 graduates because they do it two years later. Is that right, Peggy? So it's two years after. So yeah, so we go back and look after two years. So um, we've met our targets on all of that. The higher ed target was 23.8. We met it at 44.2. Um, and then our, or I mean, you can see all these. I can read them all to you. <laughs> Higher ed or competitive employment, our target was 55.8. We met that at 71.2. And then our continuing ed or employment target was 60.8%. We met it at 75%. So we're rocking that. So we've got some really great transition programs in our district. And I'm going to talk about those here um, next. So um, one thing we did a few years back in 2020 um, is we were um, trying to make sure that our students were getting, that our students in our essential skills um, programs were getting well-rounded education. And you guys um, that were here then approved um, a new curriculum where we really focused on um, like English language arts and math and like science and social studies. And we are, um, we have a whole new curriculum, sort of new now, right? But um, where kids are getting transcripted grades for those areas of the curriculum um, in the same way that students maybe that aren't in the essential skills program are. So, but we're also making sure then that they aren't taking seven PE classes to get credits yeah. and moving on, right? So um, we, we really worked on that. So, and then also, so we really feel like that's helping our kiddos. And then some of those programs like Bridge to Success over at, um, over at the hotel, and uh, those can be transcripted as some of our grades as well based on what they're working on in their, um, 
in their transition programs. On the right-hand side are some of our transition programs listed. So we start with ISVE, which is in-school vocational education, and our students um, work in those programs. Typically, they start that maybe their freshman, sophomore year. They work at Chartwells and at, on the Coffee Cabana within the building. They also have opportunities for cooperative work experience program. Lewis and Clark has the Applied Retail and Business program. And um, they are also, our students with disabilities are able to participate in the any gen ed programs over there as well. Um, they have the summer work program, summer teen employment program, and then our Bridge to Success, which our first year was in 21-22. Um, and so that's a partnership with Orchard Farm, Fort Dumont, Francis Howe, and our students have the option of working um, at Missy Suites, Convention Center, Fresh Time, and we also get support, support from the DDRB and the Center for Specialized Services with job coaching and things like that, so. All right, so um, the last section is our collaboration with parents. Um, this again, this came out of the MSET file review. So again, you'll see that this only gets reported out every three years. And so um, I believe 21-22 was our first year, and Chris might be able to tell me if I'm right. Is that the first year we sent it electronically, right? Our, our parent surveys from the state? I think so too. I think back in the 2018-19, because we only had 34 responses, they were all sent through mail and they had to send them back by mail. So now they're a lot easier to um, see and, and get and so people are able to um, report back easier. So um, we, we uh, let's see, we had um, six, we, we did drop, we had 91.2 out of the 34 respond um, back in 2018-19 that they strongly agree that they're involved in their um, children's education and special education. And last um, time we reviewed that it was at 68.5%. So that will go out again next year. We're up for file review this year. Was that 2018-19 was pre-COVID kind of? Yeah, work, I think. Um, and then, so recommendations moving forward that, um, you know, our team is kind of looking at is continuing to look at the high incidence rates of students with IEPs by reviewing the referral process and eligibility determination practices. Really looking at that three-prong eligibility, that's something that I don't think a lot of um, parents and people understand sometimes is that you can meet eligibility criteria, but you also have to show an educational impact and you have to show a need for specialized instruction, not just related services and, and things like that. So um, really taking a look at that, training on referral process and state guidelines, implementing um, our district-wide PBIS and RTI, collaborative meetings, um, training, and then providing research-based interventions prior to getting that to that referral. And a lot of those things we're already putting into place and a lot like, but like the PBIS and some of that, like we're just starting it. It's not, it's not a well-oiled machine yet. Um, focusing on student independence and least restrictive environment so that we get those kiddos more into that regular education setting. Collaboration with parents and students to get them more involved in the process. Expanded opportunities for integration into ECSE, still working on that. Um, and then focusing on improved instruction on essential grade level standards and research-based interventions for those map, you know, all those map scores in those areas that we weren't, didn't meet our, um, meet our, Targets. Sorry. All right. I have no idea how long that was, but does anybody have any questions? I have a question about I, and I know very little about elementary and preschool, but how are, I, I assume that you identify students for the early childhood um, who need special services either through their doctor are through parents as teachers, or how do you identify them? And then I have one more question. Sure, so um, first of all, uh, the same way that you would K through 12, but typically if a parent is going to refer a student for um, early childhood special education or a referral, we usually ask them first to do a parents as teacher screening. So they will do a screening, which is a lot less involved than a whole full special ed um, 
evaluation. And then from there, they can kind of pick up if there's um, some weaknesses, and it, then they will kind of help us determine if we need to move forward with the special education okay. evaluation. Um, a doctor may suggest to a family that, yes, you might want to take a student in. And, and Mike, you would have yeah. 504 students also, right, in the early childhood? We could. Okay. We could. I don't know if we do um, necessarily right now, but we could. Okay. Um, I feel like there was a second part that there, I had in I my have, head. Yeah, you answered my... Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay. One other thing, there's one extra um, identification in early childhood that most of our students in early childhood, if they're not speech or language, mm -hmm. are typically or eligible under the criteria of young child with a developmental delay. So it's a lot, it's a little bit easier to um, qualify as an early childhood student, age three through five. When they mm -hmm. get to those kindergarten right. through 12th grade, it's a little harder because they're looking at a disability more than they are looking at a delay. So... Um, yeah, Our kids have to get that are YCDD have to get reevaluated at some point during their kindergarten year to meet K through 12 eligibility. Okay, and then um, once they've been identified and you you have that data, what percentage of those students go on to enroll in the uh, early childhood program? Do you know? You know, I would hope it would be a very high. So if they qualify and mm -hmm. then they would receive an IEP then it's it's the same process where if we identify that they need say they just need speech services then mm -hmm. we would typically just typically as all you know all kids are different mm -hmm. we might bring the, have the parent bring them in for just speech services or we might visit them if they're in a preschool within the district um, if they're more involved we might recommend that they have that they participate in an early childhood special education classroom um, or um, even an early childhood classroom. And we can then, the state, if it's in the early childhood classroom, sometimes we pay part of that tuition okay. because it's funded by the grant. Um, and if it's an early childhood special education classroom, then that's fully funded. And then they come. They don't pay for those services. They would never right. pay for their special education services. So, so you kind of assume that the majority of students who qualify are getting sir are taking advantage of yes. the services yes okay. majority of them yeah i might i might have a reverse question yes and and this is i mean this is hard yeah. i think um the three prong uh criteria for children to be placed into our into a special education program um the goal is for these children to become uh, independent and have the least restrictive kind of environment. Um, so do we see children uh, being phased out of special ed programs? Yes. Because, you know, I, I'm yes. just imagining as a parent, I'd want my kid to keep getting support and maybe... Yes, and we, we say, think that contributes to the 18% a little bit. I think that's our higher We have number. a hard time at high school once they really may not need some of the... Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, services yeah. anymore um, really struggle with uh, yep. and it's not always the parent that's struggling to yep. give up the services a lot of times it's our teachers <laughs> and they just they're so they're so they care about them so much mm -hmm. they're just so afraid to like kind of let them go on their own so yeah. that's something that uh, we we changed when we when Ashley came this year we used to split the district kind of east and west now it's K through six and seven through twelve, mm -hmm. and so um, we we notice that even some high one high school might be less like likely to do that. So Ashley's been working with that, and so has Peggy all year. So and I I just mean I I'm sure that's yeah. a difficult because you, you just feel like I need that support. I, yes, I, I want to keep that. Support. And typically, once a student gets to the point they don't really need services, they just need accommodations. We would we would look at would they qualify Maybe under five hundred four because. Right, and even if they may not qualify under 504, a lot of our teachers do accommodations anyway. They they know what the kids need, and they will just give them what they need. And, and especially by the time they get to Peggy, that transition piece, uh, you, you just don't want children, our students at age 21 or so to just suddenly drop off the cliff. With yeah, so we we're supporting them quite a ways, but they have to be kind of. Yeah. phased out too. Yeah. 
and proactively. There's a lot of intervention work that needs to take place with the RTI mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And then least restrictive is a really big piece of that. Yeah. yeah. We're trying. Because <coughs> that whole process, I'm called MTSS, called it, well, I, I'm old school, I still call it RTI. That's a big rock of ours. So mm -hmm. we have to continue to grow in that area. And at transition, we have so many transitions in our district too. And I taught middle school special ed and then elementary special ed and then early childhood special ed. And it was like, as I got down, I realized that like the next building up, people in the home, like the, they think that's they're, you know, we're feeding them to the big bad wolves, you know, like, oh, are you gonna take care of them yeah. as good as we do? And so like, it's just, they're scared as they do that. And so we have so many transitions that we tend to see kids kind of stick with a lot of the same services, or sometimes you'll even see a little more added as they go up just for, just to be safe, to you down. know? And so it's, we kind of have to get out of that mindset of like the, the what ifs and like serve kids based on what they need at the, where they are, yeah. Almost like tough parenting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and some of that structure will be probably put into our CSIP plan coming up. Mm -hmm. And in our current CSIP plan that we're finishing up, there's been a lot of goals and a lot of uh, focus on what does strengthening our transitions, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah, a couple things in here. Sure. And you spit out all kinds of numbers and Sorry. data. <laughs> and It was wild and crazy. So I, I had read through your other, your other part of it and I was trying to go through some of my notes and follow along here. Uh, I, there was this part in here about suspensions and expulsions. Uh, what, what do we look at? I know that that's kind of a big thing, with, especially with kids with IEPs and stuff like that. What, what kind of things have we implemented in our districts to kind of hopefully deter some of that that happens? Yeah, and I really think that um, PBIS going district-wide, PBIS. So last, when did we do our CSEP last? Um, four, four, four Yeah, we had a student needs committee that came out of that. and where it, it wasn't all about students with IEPs or students with disabilities. We talked about um, a lot of things came out of that. Um, our behavior coaches came out of that. Our RTI specialists came out of it. A lot of our um, procedures that we, we have in the district came out of that, um, extra support. And then when we got to the kind of end of like, we're just, we don't know where to move forward. It was like really clear that we needed to go district wide with PBIS. So. Um, it's a tiered system of, you know, trying to make sure that we're, you know, we have good um, good universals in place for all kids, but then really trying to support kids that might be struggling. And um, I really feel like that is a big piece of it. When it comes to suspension and expulsions, part of what we did in June with PBIS is we sat down with all of our principals and looked at the code of conduct and tried to look at um, whether things were, and Jason, you can speak to this too, mm -hmm. like everything in there was punitive, right, with mm -hmm. our code of conducts. And so if you look at our code of conducts from two years ago versus this year, you will notice that there's a lot of proactive measures in there um, before we get, hopefully to try to, before we get to, um, a lot of out of school suspensions and a lot of even in school suspensions, or they might even be paired with a suspension, but there's also supposed to be some um, some restorative things and some, um, you know, th thank you, teaching opportunity. I feel like I've talked all like Lots about. of focus on proactive yeah. and reactive measures. And yes. it all stems to that sense of belonging for those kids. Yes. For all of our kids, but if yeah. you're, you're, at this point, we're talking special ed students. Yeah. So, What's that sense of belonging? What's those relationships look like? Not only with students and staff, but also staff to staff and peers. And so a lot of restorative work being done in our district. Again, I always would use the B word, it's balanced, right? We have a code of conduct. We have to uphold the code of conduct. So there are consequences, but also what is the, what, what are those relationships look like in restoring those relationships? And a lot of interventions, behavioral and academic happening for kids. Um, special ed and non-special ed to make sure that we're proactively involved. And PBIS just gives us that framework uh, with a flow chart and everything else that has really been a catalyst to us working with kids and, and, and hoping to deterring some of, the, some of the major behaviors or things that we see. But and again, we do have those things that happen. So we balance that with a code of conduct, obviously 
through the special ed process as well, IP process manifestations, and make sure that it's an appropriate. And that's another reason why we added that AIM program to the to the ED rooms. And so like over the course of the last few years, a lot of our ED rooms have been really revamped too to be more, um, to be utilizing our, our AIM program. And if, again, the board approved that a couple of years ago. It's really focusing on, um, uh, it's very therapeutic in nature, a lot of lessons. Um, um, I, I don't even know how to go through through the whole thing, but um, all of our, our programs are a little more structured than they ever were. Um, and so we've, we also feel like we've gotten some really good staff members in the right place for some of those programs. Uh, and so I think that, again, with some of our students who are getting a lot of long-term suspensions, like some of those programs that we've put into place or that we've kind of revamped are kind of helping them find a, a, a more nurturing kind of, ex, I don't know if I want to say accepting, because it's not accepting, but like just, you know, a better place to be, I think. So. Programming practices and, and relationships. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of hard work yeah. from our staff. Much. I'm trying to regurgitate it all, think about it. I think I'm good. I just, um, there were some other parts at the end here. It just talked about, you know, collaborating meetings between special education coordinators, psychological examiners, to discuss referrals and uh, evaluations. Does that involve, like, is that, like, the IP team, the whole IP team and the meeting with parents, or how does that? So that. You got another part in here about. Yeah. That uh, piece parent was. Parent involvement and. Yeah. The first piece you just said was more about our high rate of our high incidence. Incident rate, yeah. And so we're really, that those were those meetings and that, well, I think you're reading from the bullet point with recommendations yeah. is because we're just trying to make sure that we're really focused on making sure we're meeting the needs of the kiddos that really need that special ed services. Um, so those, that was really in reference to our high incidence rates. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Okay. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Thank you, Julie. Good job. Uh, do I have a <clears throat> motion to approve? Hey, a little shout out to our staff for coming oh. to you. Go, go. Hey. You go. But uh, that, that group does an excellent job led by Julie. So thank you to our special ed group. Thank you for staying and. Uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> and hi, Jones kids. Yeah. Good to see you, Jones kids. <laughs> he waves all over. Do I have a motion to uh, approve the special education program review as presented? I move to approve the special ed program review as presented. Do I have a sec second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that passes. And our finale? With I feel, all like, waiting for our I feel like you guys are smiling just because it's 820. <laughs> Not so much about this report. No. And if we can be out by 822. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well. well, here we go. Well, here we go. That was the job. Uh, uh, one thing, if we could scroll down to year end uh, as of February 2024, Chris. One more, I believe. There we go. So a couple things to point out to you here. Uh, trend, trends look great, especially as comparison to in, in a comparison to last year. Um, a couple things to point: salaries and benefits. We've spent about a million, just slightly a million more than last year, which is or just salaries. I'm sorry, the 6100s uh, than last year. Expected, anticipated, staff had increases. We'll see the same again next year with the negotiated agreements. To give you a comparison. We anticipate beyond where we finish this year, we'll probably just in salaries alone, we'll have about 1.4 increase, 1.5 increase, and approximate $1,500 in employee uh, raise. Uh, that's, of course, some are higher, some are lower, but that's an average that we'll see as, as we've approved those. Uh, the, the key thing that I think is important for us at this, at this point in this year is the employee benefits, the 6,200s. We are spending about 2 million less than we did the previous year which is also less than the previous year before that. If you remember, we had a couple 
horrible years as far as uh, claims, which is uh, concerning financial, but even more concerning because of what our, our uh, staff members were facing as far as health is concerned, because it was all based on claims and utilization. So as we know, as I've known since I've been in this role, it could be a couple months that pops us right back up. So I want to be extremely cautious, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged that hopefully we are, we, are, uh, we are trending in the right direction with the health of our employees at, at this point in time. So that, that being said, we're kind of offsetting that raise with some of our decrease in utilization uh, with insurance uh, at this point in time. But again, since we are fully uh, self-insured, it just takes a couple of months that could really spike that. And um, that could just be 10 employees that may not be, you know, of our 1,000 plus members that also includes retirees, uh, 10 employees could really, really increase that trend. So, um, but again, that's why insurance is there. But that's an encouraging sign and, and something I'm uh, very thankful for uh, when we're really trying to get down to the numbers. Uh, with that being said, so revenue is up, spending is, is down overall within the categories that you see, even in comparison to the previous year. But we have those concerning legislation pieces that are always going to show. We have an open enrollment piece that's out there, as you guys are well aware of. Prop is, uh, the property tax legislation is always of concern, uh, primarily because we just don't know what's going to happen. That's where I'm saying I'm concerned. You just don't know. Nothing may pass. Something may pass. We don't know. We just know of the, store, uh, of the legislation that's proposed at this point in time. And then the third uh, one, one that uh, could have a, a pretty immediate impact on our revenue is that Senate Bill 190, uh, the, the senior citizen bill, the 62 and, uh, and age of older. You know, with the applications are going out now, started March 1st. Again, not trying to do any generational warfare and what's good and what's not. Certainly not in entertaining that, but that's something that we have to think about as what the impact could be. And again, at this point in time, there's no clear picture that can be provided to us um, on how that would impact our revenue. We just don't know, again. So that's why I say it's concerning. We just don't know. I, I can't say that I'm against it because you know, certainly we want people that have paid a tremendous amount of money all their lives to have, uh, to have relief. Um, but I just don't know what that impact is and certainly have called and asked and you get told the same response. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted to bring that to you into your awareness. Uh, the other thing is um, I was able to, to listen to a financial report by a person that has been um, involved in state finances for a considerable portion of time, I'm talking 40 years, and uh, their concern is 25 and beyond on how our state is going to be able to fund. State's in great shape. They've been well managed for the, since uh, the pandemic set in, but they do see that that's going to change, or they anticipate that changing. And where we would see uh, immediate impact potentially is the Prop C money that we've been earning because of the high inflation and because of the extra spending that has happened because of the uh, flush of federal money that's been given to the state, um, they have to spend it down. So we're gonna still see another year probably of good Prop C money, but what's it going to look like after that when that money is not being spent as, as quickly as what we've seen the last four years? Um, that's added about $1.4 million to our revenue in Prop C since the pandemic started. Uh, and that's not typically something that we see large gains in. So that's been a benefit to us, but it's certainly something that we have to start projecting probably a, a reverse trend on 25 and beyond. Uh, the only other thing that I thought was important to bring to your attention in this, if uh, uh, Chris, if we could back out of that and just go to the uh, page that shows all of the attachments. Uh, the BOK Financial Bond Series 21, that's something I've never brought to your attention. I know you, you're aware of it. And then the 2017 one, this, this exists because they hold our money to ensure that we will pay our debt uh, on our bonds. So it gives us a better rate. It's something that we, in, in order to get that rate, it's something that we have to um, be involved in. The district, I believe, since 2017, at the very least, has always uh, you, uh, had our money, some of our money transferred over into this account. Uh, to give you an idea, we pay our principal and interest on our bonds on March 1st, which is about six point some odd million um, on that payment. And then September 1st is an interest only payment on both of those bonds. That usually equals one, one, two, one, three million. 
So though that is why those two accounts exist. And uh, I had never mentioned that, I don't think. So I just wanted to bring it back to your attention uh, one more time or the, for the first time possibly, because I can't remember if I've ever told you that. So uh, that should be it for me. And continue to watch your legislative updates that we send out to you. Yeah. And you. MSBA sends some pretty good updates as well because there's a lot of things going on in the legislative session at this point. So that could be harmful for us moving forward in some areas. Thank you, Jeremy. Do I have a motion? Do I have any questions for Jeremy? I move to approve the district financial report as presented. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The financial report is approved. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Do I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Wow. Did you come up with one of the Nope, we talked about it. Candy for the parade. Are we supposed to bring it here?